me, this is the worst part of sports. Uh, this is a guy who had all the talent, uh, had all the tools, wanted it in the worst way, wanted to be a star. I think we wanted him to be a star because he was such a good guy. And sometimes sports just doesn't work out that way. And honestly, JT, it's always the same reason. It's injuries. And it's just a bummer that it turned out this way. Yeah, Adam's a rider I've been watching since he was five years old. And uh, he grew up about an hour and a half away from me. So I've gotten to see not only most of his amateur career, but of course his pro career as well. And one of the nicest guys and one of the most well-spoken intellectual riders that I've, I've ever come across. Uh, so wherever he lands, he's going to be successful. But it is a shame that he, you know, you could always argue that he didn't reach his potential. But then again, he was a 250 national champion. And that there's a lot of success that he that he shared. And I think that's the way I'll remember is, him, is how well he rode on a motorcycle, not maybe some of the shortcomings. I think we kind of knew this was coming, but not maybe right here, right now. There's certainly a lot more we can talk about with seems to reload the career that he did have going forward. But let's get to some other news involving him. We thought the big scene serial news would be his mechanic, Justin Shanty, who about a month ago started asking me about real estate in North Carolina. Turns out he has a job with Toyota Racing Development in their NASCAR side and mostly working with, I think, the JGR NASCAR team. So St. Louis will be his last race in this sport. And unfortunately, Adam really didn't get to race much. But uh, Justin was always a cool character with Adam and also his days with Joey Savacci. So We'll miss him on this circuit. Yeah, it's it's hard to really think negatively of this because he's moving on to a great situation. This is something he chose to do. So I think everybody's very happy for him. It's it's our loss, not his. Uh, and, and yeah, it's going to be unfortunate to not see him in the pits every single weekend. All right, JT, we've reached that time in the program. Now break this down as you did. You actually went down to the racetrack after the race to look at the corner where Farsha hit Lawrence. Yeah, it's, uh, it's it's the widest corner that I could ever remember in Monster Energy Supercross. So let's start there, right? And when you have a corner that's this wide, you can see the drone shot there. That means that you're going to get multiple entry angles. And this corner specifically had a double apex. You can see the berm right there on the outside. That is the, the exit point where Justin Barsha was headed to. That was not the exit point that Jet Lawrence was using. So thinking about it that way there's two different ways for those guys to come into that corner and i think that's where both riders are a little bit to blame you know if jet if you're using that outside entry point going to cut down you have to always be thinking okay who's on my inside who could be putting me into a very precarious spot here especially on the first lap and if you're justin barsha and the lead rider is on that outside you have to be prepared for them to cut down and when justin barsha carries that much speed and that much momentum into a corner that disallows him from really any maneuverability whatsoever. Now he had Vince Freezy behind him. He was really worried about, I think, any sort of block pass that was coming his way. But when you really think about who's to blame here, that's where I land on a little bit of both because that awareness factor has to be the pre predominant thought on the first lap. You just have to assume that there's, there's a rider to your right, to your left, and right behind you at all times on that first lap. Gotcha. Okay. And that's not the only controversial thing in the night. So we had a red cross flag at the finish line jump. Came out as the white flag came out, was still out when the checkers came out. A lot of riders penalized. The highest profile is Lawrence because they took away his win in race two, but also Cooper Webb. Jason Anderson did it twice, which is so Jason Anderson to get double A and A penalties where everybody else only had one. Uh, but I was pretty outspoken. You and I do a podcast on uh, Sunday night and I feel like they can't just put these flags out and say, hey, it's up to you to see them. I feel like they need to talk to the riders and say, what can we do to make these easier to see? Now, Jed is gesturing there that he wants it to be waved. The reason they don't wave it is because riders in the past have said, when you wave it, we cannot see the red cross part. The flag gets furled up. So that's why they just hold it and not wave it. I get that. But I'm thinking at least maybe a yellow flag before the red cross so they at least know to start looking around. And JT... The tunnel vision you have on the track, how easy is it to always see everything at all times? Yeah, this was a really unfortunate circumstance here because you think about they're waving a white flag also, right? So that's going to naturally get their attention, not a static neutral red flag that's hanging there. So if they see anything, they're likely to see the white flag. And it was also moving away from the, their natural eye movement. The, the track was flowing to the left, the way that corner exited. They almost had to look back to their right to see any of that. So you think about their peripheral vision is all they're leaning on there. If they don't 
necessarily notice that medic flag out of the peripheral vision, they're not gonna see it at all. So it was a really tough situation. Of course, Jet didn't mean to put anyone in harm's way or you know, violate a rule. Um, but in the end, several riders did, which should tell you how difficult it was. When you have five riders that are penalized and once one rider twice, uh, that just speaks to how difficult it was to see this. There was so much going on from celebrity appearances to penalties and riders crashing into each other and Eli Tomac, a super popular win. Oh yeah, we also had the Triple Crown Championship on the line. Cooper Webb ends up scoring the most points in the Triple Crown races this year. I don't know what to mean in a normal year how much this means, but I do think it means something this year. To me, when you take these nine short races together, three events in total, doesn't this kind of prove the consistency of Cooper Webb? In my mind, this is a little symbolic about how his season has gone. Yeah, it's it really leans into his racecraft and the way he goes about things. You know, there's really no sudden movement, right? He's always there at the end, kind of finds his way to the front as he proved to us in Seattle. You know, Clinton Fowler did a great job of breaking down that start, but that is so emblematic of what he does. And he kind of sneaks up on you at the end of the night. You're not really thinking about it. He's not the... You know, the headline grabbing guy in between each of the races on the Triple Crown night. And then there he is. He's your Triple Crown champion at the end of all of this. And Cooper Webb has to be excited not only about the Triple Crown championship, but he made up more points. And that's what we've been talking about. Can he bring the number down? It got all the way to 21. And ever since then, it's gone to 16 and now 8. And we are back to the single digits and right where Cooper Webb wanted to be. Just get to the end of the series within striking distance. And we each... Here we are. Yeah, you keep saying Jet Lawrence riding well, but don't let them hang around. And Cooper Webb's hanging around. Unfortunately, though, kind of forgotten in all the stuff that happened. Look at Chase Sexton. It's a golden opportunity to make up points. He got caught early when Mitchell Oldenburg went flipping through a rhythm lane in the first race. And I often judge a rider's night based on how extensive the quote they give to their team is in the post-race PR. If it's really short, it means the guy didn't want to talk to anyone, not even his own team. And basically, all Sexton said was, I'm ready for a weekend off. So not what he needed after almost winning that race in Seattle. He needed to get maybe within 15 or 10 points, and he could have if St. Louis went a little better. It might be down to just Webb and Jed at this point. And more points to talk about, which is our playoffs. We had so much fun last year looking at the playoff bubble. Those riders 15 to 20, trying to make it in, guaranteed, not having to go to the LCQ. And I look at this group here, and here's what's interesting. We don't even know how many of these guys are going to race for motocross. Jorge Prado, we assume, is not going to race in America until next year. Dean Wilson, can he make his way back from injury? He wants to. Benny Bloss, Beta, has said right now they're only going to race Supercross, but they might do select pro motocross rounds. Justin Hill is back to being the mystery Justin Hill this year. I don't know what to make of this group, JT, and who's going to be in the top 20. It's a pretty wild bunch. Yeah, trying to make predictions right now is a fool's errand, but it's going to be fantastic to watch all of this. It's fluid, right? And, and all those variables that you mentioned are going to play out over the next several months. We'll get into pro motocross. And remember all the suspense at the last couple of rounds about who's in and who's out. Uh, it's so great to kind of have a, a sneak peek of what that's going to be like and kind of follow it early this year. Oh, we have not even, I can't believe we've gone this far. We've not even covered the 250 class because there was so much to talk about. Uh, but there's really only one thing to talk about in that division, and it's what is going on with Levi Kitchen? What has gotten into this guy? What a breakout season it has been for Levi Kitchen. And remember, just because he only has 17 races in the books in Monster Energy Supercross, he's 23 years old. So he's developed. I think he has the mental maturity to be in this situation now. And he is very aware that he has taken control of this series. And I, ha I had the opportunity to sit next to Mitch Payton on the flight home on Sunday. And both of us agreed that Levi's doing it effortlessly. He's not taking big risks. He doesn't look like he's riding over his head and things are just clicking. And that's a really, powerful thing because most of these guys in this class seem like they're taking a lot of risk to win that is not the feeling that i'm getting from levi kitchen he looks like he's in his comfort zone which is a very dangerous thing to everybody not named levi kitchen all right so that's kitchen and the guys in the west let's update you on 250 east because they will be racing when we return from our break which will be in foxborough massachusetts here are the standings it is so close between mcadoo and vial pierce brown quietly is still in it even without a podium Hayden Deegan's not out-out, uh, down 16 points you see there. 
I feel like JT, McAdoo's kind of becoming the feel-good story. I feel like internally, if you're not personally involved with any rider in this championship, I think people want to see McAdoo get this done just because all he's been through, and not just this season, his whole career. It'll be interesting to see if he can ride that wave because I think there's a real vibe here for McAdoo at the moment. Yeah, it's, it's hard to not cheer for Cameron McAdoo, but I really believe that this 250 E series is going to see a big shakeup. I don't think Hayden Deegan is done with this thing. We haven't even seen the best from Pierce Brown yet. We haven't really seen him at the front at all. And you look back and you see him hanging around in this championship. And the biggest variable of all for me is that we're gonna have these two showdown events. And you think about the mix of talent, the way these points can really kind of go all over the place, right? One good race, one bad race from one of the key guys and everything changes. So. I'm still super excited about the way this 250E shakes up and you think about the races coming down the road and what that could do to this championship. Okay, so this is interesting. I'm already picturing this feel-good title for Cameron McAdoo, but you're saying, look out, could be more to come from Hayden Deegan. Yeah, I think with the showdown races and the opportunity and points there, plus I don't think we've seen the best version of Hayden Deegan that we will in this championship yet. So he's got a lot of pressure on him. He's 16 points down but I do think there is winning in his future. And we know that this class can be so chaotic and the picture can flip upside down very, very quickly. Ooh, wow, that's that's gonna be exciting when we go back to Foxborough. Hi folks, Lee Diffie from NBC Sports here. If you truly enjoyed what you just watched, you can get more news, interviews, and highlights by subscribing to the Motorsports on NBC YouTube page. You can get it all, so go for it.